Maybe not. Um, let's see. So uh, as I announced on email last night, uh, exams are available in the BB office. That's ALS 2011. You can pick them up there. You'll need your ID. Um, I normally post um, on the class web page the grade distribution uh, so you can see what grade you made on the exam, except for OSU's website got hit by hackers this weekend and they shut down access. So that's why I haven't posted the videos of last week's lecture and all that sort of stuff. Um, I can't get into the site. So what I did earlier this morning was I emailed to each of you um, a, um, a JPEG that shows that distribution. So you can see where you stand letter grade wise relative to the um, overall uh, class. So you should have that. If you have any questions about that, please let me know. Um, and as I said, because the OSU site is down, I can't, <clears throat> excuse me, I can't upload stuff into it. So I cannot upload last week's lecture materials and so forth. Uh, Wednesday's lecture, I think I mentioned in class, is completely lost, so um, I don't have a way of, of um, um, getting that, but um, the uh, lecture for, no, see, it was, it was the previous Wednesday, wait a minute, one of the Wednesdays, the 21st, I guess it was, the, 21st, the lecture for the 21st uh, is completely lost, so there is still a redundant uh, copy of that from the 19th, but that's going to go away as soon as I can get into the site and get it removed, so that'll be there. All right. Um, let's see. What else am I going to say? There is a key posted outside my office. If you have questions, uh, as always, uh, please let me know. I'm happy to talk to you about the exam. Let's uh, turn our attention now uh, to uh, some more on regulation. So if you recall last time when I talked about regulation, I finished by talking about the uh, uh, covalent modification. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, by, by talking about protein kinase A. Protein kinase A, I will remind you, is a kinase, which means it's an enzyme that puts phosphates onto things. And it's a kinase um, that is very, very important in a phenomenon that we'll soon be talking about called cellular signaling. And it really is communicating a signal or propagating a signal through a cell. And it's doing that by participating in a chain of events, as we shall see. And that chain of events that it participates in is its addition of a phosphate to uh, other proteins, and we'll see how that has effects. Now, I mentioned that, cyc that cyclic AMP is the allosteric regulator of that enzyme, and cyclic AMP is a small molecule that binds to the regulatory subunits of the uh, protein kinase A. It causes the catalytic subunits to be released from the regulatory subunits, and when that happens, the catalytic subunits are free to uh, catalyze reactions. I pointed out that this is one of those rare cases where we see an allosteric mechanism that is completely an on or off switch. If the uh, cyclic AMP is present, then the regulatory site is released from the catalytic, the enzyme is active. If the regulatory site is gone, then the um, uh, catalytic site binds to the regulatory uh, subunit and the enzyme is inhibited. And that's, that's, that's pretty much an on-off. We don't see a lot of on-off switches with allosteric mechanisms. Now, what I want to talk about today, <coughs> excuse me, are several things of medical note. Um, and uh, they are related to the chemical modification uh, or the covalent modification of enzymes. So you've already seen one example of covalent modification of enzymes, and that is the reaction that's catalyzed, catalyzed by <coughs> protein kinase A. Protein kinase A puts a phosphate onto um, target proteins. That has an effect. I didn't say too much about that last time, but it has an effect on those proteins. We mentioned that. That, of course, is uh, adding negative charges, and adding negative charges to a protein may have structural changes that it causes inside of that protein. And those structural changes can be uh, either activating that enzyme that is, that, that's gotten the phosphate or inhibiting the enzyme that's gotten that phosphate, and it differs. Some enzymes are activated by phosphorylation. Other enzymes are inhibited by phosphorylation. Okay? Now, uh, we're going to see other covalent uh, modification mechanisms today, and the ones I'm going to be talking about today will all be mechanisms that activate the um, target enzymes. Okay? So specifically, I'm going to be talking about a class of enzymes that has a name. They're called zymogens, Z-Y-M-O-G-E-N-S. Zymogens are enzymes that are synthesized in an in inactive form. That is an inactive form, not active. And 
there's some very good reasons why that's the case. You'll see two setups uh, as I talk about them today, but there's some very good reasons why they're synthesized in inactive forms. And so I'll be going through that. And so a lot of what we'll be interested in is how uh, they are activated and when they are activated, when they're not activated, et cetera, because that's a very, very crucial component, a very, very crucial consideration. Not so much for the cell that has them, but for the organism. Okay? And we'll see that these are organismal controls that are very, very important considerations. Well, when we think about modification of enzymes, of course, there are many modifications of enzymes that can occur. I mentioned phosphorylation is a covalent modification as a result of a kinase. One of the things that you'll see as you study cells and you study biochemistry inside of cells is the fact that um, the, um, uh, whatever ha a cell has a switch that turns something on or off, it also has the opposite control as well available to it. So just as cells will have the ability to put a phosphate on, so too will they have the ability to take that same phosphate off. Both of those are covalent modifications because you're actually making and breaking covalent bonds, making it to put a phosphate on, breaking it to take a phosphate off. I mentioned that kinases are enzymes that put phosphates on. We give a name to enzymes that take phosphates off, and they're called phosphatases. P-H-O-S-P-H-A-T-A-S-E-S. -S -E phosphatases are enzymes that remove phosphates. So they work opposite of kinases. And as we shall see later in the term when we talk about control of glycogen metabolism, the removal of phosphates is a very, very essential thing and it's a very, very important consideration for controlling the activities of enzymes. Not surprisingly, if putting a phosphate on turns an enzyme on, taking a phosphate off is going to turn the enzyme off. Okay? Conversely, if putting a phosphate on turns an enzyme off, then taking the phosphate off is going to turn the enzyme on. So kinases and phosphatases are going to have opposite effects on activities of target proteins. Well, there's other covalent modifications uh, that can occur to proteins. One is acetylation of lysine. And this is a little confusing because in this case, it's, uh, the target is not really an enzyme, but it is in fact uh, a very important protein. Um, when we look at our DNA, for example, what we discover is that DNA is way too long to fit into our cells. And in order to fit DNA into our cells, our cells use a little roller mechanism, a little rolling the ball of DNA up, and the roller that they use are, are proteins called histones. Histones are very good at covering up DNA. But if the uh, DNA is very covered up and the cell needs to do something like replicate or transcribe to make RNA, then it really has to unwrap a section of that um, uh, DNA. And the unwrapping mechanism involves the acetylation of histones. It involves putting an acetyl group onto a, histone, uh, onto a lysine side chain. Okay? Now, <clears throat> What effect do you suppose that putting an acetyl group onto a lysine side chain would have chemically? What's the charge on lysine? It's positive. What's the charge on an acetyl group? It's zero when you put it on. Okay? So you're converting this guy from a positive charge to a charge of zero. The positive charge on lysine is very important because DNA is negatively charged. And so that negative positive charge interaction helps to hold them pretty tightly together. But when you start changing those positive charges to zero charges, that binding is not nearly so tight. And what you see is uh, that the histone sort of loosens up, loosens its grip on the DNA, and the DNA can be peeled apart from the histone much more readily as a result of that. And we'll talk about that next term. But this is a covalent modification that happens to proteins. It affects the protein's function in this case, which is binding to DNA. It's not an enzyme per se, but there are some enzymes that actually do get their uh, lysine residues uh, modified. Well, here's the um, catalytic activity. Again, I come back to, to protein, kinase, protein kinases. And by the way, there are more than one protein kinase. That's why you see protein kinase A. We'll talk later in the term about protein kinase C. And, um, the action that they catalyze is pretty straightforward. 
Here is the hydroxyl group of a side chain of a protein. That hydroxyl group can be either a serine, a threonine, or a tyrosine. And this uh, hydroxyl group is the target for the transfer of a phosphate. We can see the phosphate is donated by ATP, which means that, again, ATP is serving a dual role. It's providing the energy necessary for the reaction to be catalyzed, as well as the phosphate that gets transferred uh, in the reaction. The product of that is a phosphorylated protein uh, plus uh, ADP. Okay. Oh, didn't mean to do that. that was, we did that last time. That's right. Okay. Um, so uh, we're going to see uh, in, during the term that uh, protein kinases are very, very important. Uh, they play very critical roles in controlling all kinds of things that cells have to do. The things that cells have to do uh, largely involve their response to their environment. And we think about, well, you know, what kinds of things could be out there. Um, when we think of a multicellular organism like what we are, we have certain uh, cells of our body that have specialized functions. So for example, our liver plays many, many roles. Um, one, of, one of the major ones is controlling uh, concentrations of glucose in the bloodstream. So signaling is very important because the liver doesn't have eyes. It can't see what's out there. It doesn't have um, an ability to know what the organism needs short of signaling. And so with signaling, what happens is the liver gets told, okay, we've got glucose concentrations low. We need to start putting glucose out in the bloodstream. Or perhaps glucose concentrations are very high. We should be doing something about getting those concentrations lower. So these signaling processes that happen, and, and they're largely controlled by hormones, these signaling processes that happen are critical for the function of the liver cell, even though the liver cell itself is only one cell of uh, trillions of cells that exist within the organism. You can see there are a variety of signals, and we'll talk about the signals later, cyclic nucleotides like cyclic AMP. Uh, there's also cyclic GMP, and we'll talk about that next term. Cyclic GMP is involved in vision, actually, very important role in vision. Um, calcium, calmodulin, AMP, diglycerol, blah, 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 a bunch of these. But you'll see that every one of these is in some way interacting with a kinase and affecting that kinase's activity. So again, I want to just reiterate that point that kinases are essential, <coughs> excuse me, are essential um, in that signaling process. Okay, and dephosphorylation of proteins happens, as I said, as a result of action of enzymes known as phosphatases. Uh, the most common phosphatase we'll talk about is that your book calls protein phosphatase. Most uh, books call it phosphoprotein phosphatase, and I'll take either one as answers on exams. But uh, basically what this phosphatase does, it recognizes a protein with a phosphate, and it uh, uses water to help cleave that phosphate off uh, and leave an OH group. You'll notice that this is not the reversal of the reaction of the kinase. The kinase used ATP to do this, and it produced ADP. So if we were reversing the kinase reaction, we would be regenerating ATP, and we're not doing that. So we're simply cleaving the phosphate off, and as a result, we have a dephosphorylated protein. One of the common questions that you'll ask me later in the term is, well, where does all this phosphate come from? And my answer always is that, well, your cells are loaded with phosphate, and this is a prime example. Phosphates are going on, phosphates are coming off, and there's all kinds of phosphate available in cells for cells to do the kinds of things that they need to. So uh, that's what happens in a phosphatase reaction. Okay. Um, the free energy consideration, as I noted, is, um, uh, I didn't, as I note, but as I noted, it takes, it takes uh, ATP uh, energy to put a, a phosphate onto a protein. If I try to reverse that reaction, it's very hard to do because I have to regenerate ATP. So rather than regenerating ATP, the cell takes the easy way out and simply clips that off and goes down this path, which makes this removal much more easily. Otherwise, it would require regeneration of ATP, which is not a, a, a trivial thing. Okay. Well, I promised I would talk about zymogens, and that's what I want to talk about now. So zymogens are proteins, and specifically they are enzymes, that are synthesized in a, an inactive state. They're synthesized in an inactive state, meaning that they do not have any function whatsoever 
um, when they're made. This is very, very important. Okay? So if we look, for example, at the enzymes involved in digestion, you'll discover that digestive juice has all kinds of proteases, and proteases are very, very um, efficient. And they're essential for digestion because what you're doing is you're breaking down protein that you've consumed in your diet uh, to release the amino acids so that your body has those amino acids to make its own proteins. And that's basically what's happening there. Proteases, because they're so efficient, they will eat any protein, basically. Okay? So they're very, very good at, wh at what they do. The proteins in digestion are made largely in the pancreas. And the pancreas is uh, an organ that... Um, has proteins of its own on its cell surface. And so um, if the cell releases, um, if the uh, pancreas releases proteases out uh, so that they can go to digestion, if it releases active proteases, then what happens is those proteases attack the pancreas, and the pancreas uh, becomes inflamed, the pancreas becomes damaged. Uh, you create a condition known as pancreatitis. And pancreatitis, uh, for anybody who's ever had it, probably a few people in here have had it, is a very painful, can be life-threatening um, uh, condition. And it's not something that you want to experience because literally the proteases that you're releasing are in fact attacking your own pancreas. So instead of having that happen, for the most part, when the system is working properly, what happens is that the uh, um, uh, proteases are released by the pancreas in a zymogen form where they're not active and they travel away from the pancreas, and they get activated later. Okay. Now, the problem with pancreatitis is not that the enzymes are made in an, act, in, in a, in an active form. That's not what happens. But in, instead, what's happened is you've had backup into the pancreas of enzymes that activate those inactive enzymes. Okay. And I'll, we'll see, uh, hopefully, in a minute how that happens. Okay. So when things start backing up, okay, you've had a blockage or you've had something going on in your digestive system, then those enzymes that are present in the digestive system that will normally activate the, 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 the inactive proteases, those start backing up towards the pancreas and then uh, activating those proteases closer and closer to the pancreas and ultimately causing problems. Now, one of the questions I get from this is, well, okay, the pancreas is just one of many organs to be concerned about with respect to proteases attacking things. What about the digestive system itself? Okay. Don't the proteases attack the digestive system? And the answer is yes, they do. Okay. So the proteases that are, once they're made into the active form, they do, to some extent, attack the digestive system. The digestive system is interesting and unusual in that it is probably one of the most rapidly proliferating tissues in your body. It's, it's got a built-in mechanism that recognizes we're going to lose a decent amount of our cells in the process. So the, the, the digestive system is continually making more and more digestive cells to keep that from happening. Okay? When you hear about an ulcer, one of the causes of an ulcer is that you may be inhibiting the production of more new digestive cells. If, you're, if you inhibit in some way the project, production of new digestive cells, then the old ones, when they get damaged, don't have something backing them up, you're going to have pain. You're going to have a problem. Okay? How does that happen? Well, there's a, a variety of causes that are known of ulcers. Um, the one that we know of now is a bacterium that causes ulcers. And to my knowledge, this bacterium has, is called Helicobacter pylori, which you don't need to know that. Uh, to my knowledge, this bacterium has not been implicated in uh, the inhibiting the, the um, growth of digestive cells. But something else that people do really does inhibit the growth of digestive cells, and that's taking daily aspirin. Okay? Some people are very, very susceptible to ulcers from aspirin. Okay? And um, for a long time, it wasn't clear why aspirin was causing a problem. The reason being that, well, you know, people say, oh, aspirin's got, it's acetyl salicylic acid, so you're putting acid down there and you're just eating up those cells. And the amount of acid that's contained in a tiny aspirin tablet compared to what's in your digestive juice is so small as to be 100% trivial. I used to argue this all the time. I said, this is stupid. This is, doesn't make any sense. This aspirin is causing somebody to have an ulcer? Well, the aspirin causes the ulcer, but not because of its acid content. As we'll talk uh, later, I think next term, 
um, aspirin is involved in uh, controlling the production of molecules called prostaglandins. Prostaglandins, the reason we take an aspirin is prostaglandins are implicated in pain as one of their functions. So if you inhibit the production of prostaglandins, what you're doing is you're inhibiting things that you associate with pain, maybe a headache or maybe joint ache or something like that. Okay? But prostaglandins have other functions, and some prostaglandins are involved in stimulating the growth of digestive tissue. So for people who take, and you take an aspirin here or there, it's not going to affect you, okay? But people who have chronic conditions where they have to take a lot of aspirin, they take it over a long period of time, frequently do experience uh, problems in their digestive system because they are, in fact, reducing the level of production of digestive cells and the um, digestive system is having literally hot spots as a result of that. Okay, well, let's talk now about that process by which we convert those zymogens into active enzyme forms. By the way, any questions before I move forward? Very quiet group today. Mahalloween must have taken it out of you. Yeah, and what? Just ate lunch. So I'm tired. Just ate lunch. Okay. He's tired, so. You guys do look kind of tired. You want a joke? All I have is a pun. I have a pun. This is one I made up, though. Okay, so I can, if you don't like this one, then you can, you can really blame me on this one, okay? All right. What do you call people who worship paper bags? Kind of like the kids that had the paper bags going around getting the candy this weekend, right? What do you call people who worship paper bags? Sacrilegious. <laughs> that is the first time I have ever gotten applause for that joke, and it's probably the last time as well. All right. Let's look at what's happening in, uh, in the activation of zymogens from the pancreas. So there's the pancreas. Uh, it has specialized, the pancreas does a lot of stuff for us, folks. It's making enzymes involved in digestion. The pancreas has specialized cells that make insulin that are involved in controlling the levels of blood glucose. But we're going to focus here specifically on the release of um, uh, uh, zymogens by the pancreas. So uh, what we see, and this isn't a very good diagram, unfortunately, but what we see is that these guys inside the cell are, as I said, synthesized in an inactive form, and they're exported out of the cell. So one of the things that cells uh, have the ability to do when they make a protein is proteins have little bitty identity tags on them, telling the cell where they're supposed to go. So some proteins will have an identity tag that says they're supposed to go to the nucleus, Others have an identity tag that says they're supposed to go to the cytoplasm. Maybe some will go to the lysosome, et cetera. Uh, but uh, other proteins have license tags on them that say, get me out of the cell. So the secreted proteins, which is what these enzymes are, the secreted proteins uh, or ID tag is red, and these proteins are released away from the cell. Okay? So the pancreas releases these guys. Now, keep in mind, if in the fluid around the pancreas that we have the enzymes that will activate those, that's how we're going to get pancreatitis. Okay? What happens in the normal scheme of things is those enzymes, the, those, those, those inactive enzymes, leave the area of the pancreas. They travel into the digestive system, and they encounter a, uh, uh, another enzyme called trypsin. Now, trypsin itself is made in an inactive form by the pancreas, okay? And trypsin is actually activated by another enzyme called enteropeptidase. I'll show you a scheme in a minute, okay? Ultimately, there has to be a control switch, and we're not going to get back to that ultimate control switch. We're going to sort of step in the middle of these mechanisms and look and see, because I think it's easier to see the middle than it is to try to trace back to the beginning. Well, here's our friend, <coughs> by the way, Whenever something is synthesized in an inactive form, it is called a zymogen, as I said. And the nomenclature, at least the modern nomenclature, is that the form of the enzyme, when it's in the inactive form, has this, these letters O-G-E-N on the end. So chymotrypsin in its inactive form is called chymotrypsinogen, telling us that this is a zymogen of chymotrypsin. It's not active. Now, unfortunately, older proteases don't have that nomenclature. I'll show you some examples in a minute, but that's, that's what the modern nomenclature is, is to put that O-G-E-N on the end. All right, so chymotrypsinogen is released. It travels away from the pancreas. It gets into the digestive system. And in the digestive system, there are plenty of um, 
copies of trypsin. Trypsin will cleave chymotrypsin, uh, will cleave chymotrypsinogen at one specific amino acid residue. It, makes, it cleaves a peptide bond between amino acids 15 and 16. And no, you don't have to know those numbers. But it is cleaving a peptide bond, okay, specifically at that place. Now, what happens with that? Uh, it, well, I, let me ask you: What, what do you suppose happens when I uh, make a cleave of, cleavage of a peptide bond? Shape change, okay. And what is what, what do you suppose? Why do you suppose shape change might be very effective in controlling whether an enzyme is completely inactive or active? What, what's what's being changed? What's that? Well, structure, but I'm saying, what's, what about the structure? What, what specifically on the enzyme? There's, there's some access that's being gained. Yes? Is it changed so it can move the cell? Well, it's already out of the cell. It's already been out of the cell by that point, so it's in the digestive system. Yes? It's opening up its active site. That's exactly what's going on. Okay? So what's happening is that the active site in the original uh, way the protein is made is completely covered up. Nothing can get at it. It's a very, very effective way of keeping, keeping that from doing anything. When the bond between 15 and 16 is cleaved, access to the active site is increased slightly. Slightly. So this makes a, a, a slightly active form of chymotrypsin called pi chymotrypsin. And you notice it says active. It's actually slightly active. There's only one thing that, chymo, uh, that pi chymotrypsin will cleave and that's itself. So it will cleave other copies of pi chymotrypsin. And when it does that, it cleaves, you can see here, it cleaves between 13 and 14. And once it cleaves between 13 and 14, 14 and 15 go flying away. Nothing to hold them around. It cleaves over here between 146 and 147, and also between 148 and 149, so that 147 and 148 go flying away. And now we've got three chains, an A chain, a B chain, and a C chain, but they don't go flying away. Why do you suppose they don't go flying away? What holds them together? What's that? Yeah, but there's a better answer. What's, what's, what's going to hold these guys together? We've broken the peptide bonds. So what's the only other bonds, or the only other covalent bonds that's going to hold it together? Disulfites, okay? So disulfites help to hold this molecule together. Now this guy is much more open. The active site is very accessible. And this guy can start cleaving to its little heart's content, cutting more and more proteins, okay? Okay, so that's what's happening. Now I'm going to show you a figure that I have that illustrates this, okay? And this looks, you know, not... Um, uh, very, like there's very much change that's happened. What we see is the inactive form in red. We see the active form uh, in blue. And this one only shows the cleavage of that uh, very first uh, one, which is 15 and 16. But look what happens. When you break that bond, this bond here was attached to this guy right here. Big change there. Okay? And as a result, we move from having this cover over the top. There it was there. It's moving down here. Okay. This cover is completely exposed so that now the um, uh, active site, which is down in here, can actually be accessed. And the substrate can get in there, the enzyme can bind to it, and it can catalyze further uh, breakage of peptide bonds. Okay. So cleavage of that one peptide bond is literally opening the lid to this enzyme and allowing this, the uh, active site to be accessible. Make sense? Okay. Additional cleavages, as you can imagine, will uh, free up other things and make the active site completely open and available. Well, as I said, um, trypsin itself is synthesized in an inactive form, and it is activated from trypsinogen by this enteropeptidase. Enteropeptidase is what, for our purposes, is going to be the master controller. Okay. Enteropeptidase is an enzyme that controls the activation of trypsin, and trypsin, as you can see, controls the activation of many other enzymes. Many other enzymes. Here's chymotrypsinogen, which you've already seen. 
Most of these are proteases, but not all of them. And I'll show you the one that's not on this scheme. Okay? Here's proelastase. Proelastase is uh, converted into elastase. That's a protease. Procarboxypeptidase. Notice that they're using the pro term instead of ogen on the end. That's the older nomenclature. So when you saw pro, that meant it was something that preceded the active form. We'll talk about proinsulin. It's the form that exists before insulin is active. Okay. So pro at the, at the beginning basically means the same thing as ogen does on the end. It's the inactive form of the enzyme. Okay. Proelastase made into elastase. Procarboxypeptidase made into carboxypeptidase. These three guys over here are all digestive system enzymes. Here is a digestive system enzyme as well, except for it doesn't break down protein, it breaks down fat. Okay. So prolipase is controlled also by uh, peptidase cleavage uh, to, com to uh, convert into lipase. Okay, so that's what's happening then in the activation of zymogens in the digestive system. There are inhibitors of the um, uh, uh, proteases, and the inhibitors, as you might imagine, play very important roles because there's times that you don't want to have the inhibitors active all the time. If they're active all the time, there might be some places where that would cause problems. And so the body, in addition to making the uh, active enzymes, makes the uh, very potent inhibitors of those enzymes as well. Now I want to give you uh, an example of one place uh, for medical purposes where the inhibitor is very, very uh, important. And this uh, is an enzyme, uh, this is an inhibitor that's called alpha-1 antitrypsin. Alpha-1 antitrypsin. Okay. The important thing about alpha-1 antitrypsin isn't that it inhibits trypsin. It turns out it was named before its real significance was, uh, was appreciated. Okay. It, was, it was named before it was recognized what the most important inhibitor was. It, it will inhibit trypsin, and it's very good at inhibiting trypsin. But it's also very good at inhibiting many serine proteases. Okay? One of these proteases that alpha-1 antitrypsin is good at inhibiting is found in your lungs. And it's called elastase. Okay? Elastase. Now, well, what's the role? I haven't talked about the inhibitors. Why are inhibitors important? <clears throat> First of all, you have a protease in your lungs called elastase. Why do you suppose you have a protease in your lungs? It's not part of your digestive system. What do you suppose it's doing? What's it, what's it cleaving, huh? It's not part of the immune system, no. Not surface tension, no. Ah, as I breathe in, what am I getting? Oxygen, what else am I getting? Bacteria, okay. So one of the protective mechanisms is that if I have proteases that can break down proteins in the bacterial cell surface, that provides some level of protection that has nothing to do with the immune system, but it is an important protective mechanism. Okay? Well, a little bit of protease is good. Too much protease is bad. So if I have too much elastase active, elastase is going to do to my lung tissues what the active proteases did to my uh, pancreas. In fact, if I have too much active um, proteases in my lungs, I'm going to develop emphysema. Okay? Because what happens is those proteases start attacking the tissue in the lungs and causing problems. So there has to be a proper balance between the amount of protease that's there and the amount of inhibitor that's there. That Make sense? If I disturb that balance, then I'm going to have real problems. How do I disturb that balance? Well, one of the ways I disturb that balance is by uh, oxidizing the alpha-1 antitrypsin. Okay? If I oxidize alpha-1 antitrypsin, what happens is I convert a methionine residue in it into an oxidized form of the methionine residue. This guy up on the very top will not, underline not, bind to elastase. 
it will not stop elastase from being active. And as a consequence, lung, this, this active elastase will then attack the uh, lung tissue, causing emphysema. I'll let you guess what causes this guy to be oxidized. Cigarette smoking, okay? So one of the reasons that cigarette smoking is associated with emphysema is because you're oxidizing the alpha-1 antitrypsin in your lungs. It's not able to inhibit the elastase, and the elastase goes crazy tackling, attacking tissue inside of your lungs. Okay? So it's not a good career move, shall we say. Not a good career move. Okay, makes sense? Clear as mud? Okay. Let's see. What else do we have here? All right. So that's what I want to say relevant uh, to proteases, uh, at least proteases in the lungs and in the pancreas. There's another uh, set of proteases that are, are also a very important uh, medical considerations that we need to understand. And I think in some ways they're actually even more critical than what we have with the two that I just mentioned. And these are, of course, the proteases that are involved in the clotting of blood. Right? Now, the clotting of blood is, I think, a magical thing. Let's imagine what, what, what the body has to do. The body has to be able to basically recognize in the first place that it's been uh, damaged. It has to recognize that it's losing blood. It has to synthesize its own plug. That plug has to be made from molecular components. It has to be made in the matter of minutes, and it has to be watertight. Okay? Now, I think that's pretty amazing. The molecular components that it uses are proteins. And the proteins that it uses form really interesting, really cool polymers. When we talk about polymer chemistry, we're really talking about what's happening in blood clotting. This is the good side. The bad side is that I've got to keep all of these things floating through my bloodstream all the time, and I don't want to have any false signals going off, because if I have false signals going off, I'm going to form a blood clot in a place where I don't want to form a blood clot, perhaps in the blood going to my brain, perhaps in the blood in my heart. This would be a very severe problem. So I have to have something that literally has a hair trigger, but that doesn't go off when I don't want it to go off. That is, I think, the most important thing to think about with respect to blood clotting. So not surprisingly, what we have circulating in our bloodstream all of the time are zymogens of the clotting. Zymogens of the clotting. And there are many of them. Many, many steps. This process uh, is the first scheme that you've seen of something we call a cascade. So a molecular cascade works kind of like a cascade, the, the waterfalls do in the uh, Cascade Mountain Range. The reason they're called the cascades is because they do cascade. Okay? If you go way to the top or you go up to the pass, let's say you go to Santee Ann Pass and you hike around and you see these nice little streams, and you go hiking down the mountain, what you discover is those streams have waterfalls and they cascade, and then the two streams start joining to each other and they make a bigger waterfall. And the further you go down the mountain, the bigger that stream becomes because you start coalescing all of these different streams into one. What's happening here is very much the same thing, only it's happening at the molecular level. I'm not going to require you to memorize this figure, so don't worry about that to start with. Okay? I show you this figure to show you, first of all, this is a very, very involved process. It's a process that at each step involves amplification. Just like at each step in the Cascade Mountain Range, when the two streams came together, they made a bigger stream. This guy here, okay, starting at about right here, is an enzyme. An enzyme can catalyze the activation of many more enzymes and many more enzymes can catalyze the activation of even many more. So if we had a hundred-fold amplification at each step, 100, 10,000, 1 million, 100 million, you start to see that each step in the process generates an enormous signal. It's because of this cascading mechanism that we can make a blood clot very quickly once the signal is recognized. OK? 
Okay? Once, we, once the signal is recognized, we can do this very quickly. You'll see that there are two pathways, some that are involved in what are uh, called um, uh, tissue damage, others that are involved in actual tearing and so forth. And we're not going to worry about the intrinsic versus the extrinsic. That's not the important message here. The important message is that this process gives gigantic amplification of a signal, of a single signal in a single place, and mobilizes a defense at the site of the wound. That's the second part of it. This has to happen at the site of the wound. You can say, hey, the body can say, I've been damaged, but if it starts making blood clots in the brain instead of the place where you've cut yourself, you're going to bleed to death and block your blood flow to your brain. Not, not a good career move, right? So everything that I'm going to be talking about relates to basically keeping these important proteins at the site of the wound. All right? Now, as a consequence of that, I'm not going to go through this schematic of all these things up here. Not surprisingly, some of these guys, when they are deficient, lead to deficiencies in being able to clot blood. Okay? So when you've heard of hemophilia, okay? people who have genetic uh, tendency, to, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, have, have um, uh, problems with, with clotting uh, of their blood, okay? they have clotting problems, these, they, they're deficient in one or more of these proteins that are listed above. We're going to focus our attention down near the bottom. We're going to assume that the signal has already been made and we are, in fact, going to see the end results of that signal. We will start right here at prothrombin. Okay? Prothrombin, as its name suggests, is a zymogen. It's a zymogen that gets activated by this, uh, these various factors, which I won't uh, go into here. But when prothrombin is converted to thrombin, Thrombin converts the next protein in the scheme, which is fibrinogen, into fibrin. Fibrin is the protein that makes the polymers that makes the clots. Oh, so I've saved you an awful lot of stuff up here. Okay? We're going to focus on the stuff down here. All right? Now, there are things I will say in a little bit about prothrombin that we need to keep in mind. And there are things that we'll need to say, see about fibrinogen with respect to its polymerization. But those are the, the main focus of blood clotting we're going to have is right down at the bottom of this scheme. Yes, Lane. You said that and then what happens thrombin is then active and it converts fibrinogen to fibrin. Okay. So fibrin is the po polymeric form um, that leads to the formation of blood clots. All right, so let's for the moment focus on fibrinogen, okay? Fibrinogen has a structure that looks like this, okay? It's a dimer, meaning that it has two identical sets of, it's a dimer of dimers, two identical sets of subunits, okay? It's, I'm sorry, it's a dimer of trimers, a, alpha, beta, and gamma. You can see them here, all right? And importantly, when we look at this guy, what we see is that they have on there, they have little tails hanging off of there. You're looking at the zymogen form, meaning that this is the inactive form. This is fibrinogen. The tails that are on fibrinogen are called B because they're attached to the beta units. They're called A because they're attached to the alpha units. Okay? When prothrom I'm sorry, when thrombin converts fibrinogen into fibrin, what it's doing is it's cleaving these places right here. It's cleaving the A's off and it's cleaving the B's off. Okay? Now, as we shall see, what happens is that the B's can stick into the, 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 the I'm sorry, what's left where the B's are can stick into this little hole in the betas and the part that's left with the alphas can stick into where the gammas are. Now, I, I will try to show you that in a figure here. And that's shown right here. Okay. What this is showing is that the alphas, did I say that right? I think that's right. The alphas are sticking into the gammas. Okay. What you don't see are the betas sticking into the, the, the betas, the B sticking into the, the, what's left of the B sticking into the betas. What you see in this dimension is a polymer that's two-dimensional, a two-dimensional polymer. To make it three-dimensional, we've got to stick things in through the surface of the board. So now the, the, 
the um, bees are going to stick in the betas, those little holes right there, and it's now going to build the polymer out in this, in this direction. So what's being assembled is a three-dimensional polymer. It's a three-dimensional polymer that assembles very quickly. It assembles on its own. It doesn't need anything else. And it's watertight. Now, what's important at this point is that what is holding this thing together, that is the A sticking in the, in the uh, gammas and the B sticking in the Bs, what's holding this guy together at this point is basically hydrogen bonds. A lot of hydrogen bonds, but nonetheless, hydrogen bonds. There's no covalent bonds that have been made as a result of this. No covalent bonds that have been made. All right? What we have made is what I, what I have just described to you is what's called a soft clot. A soft clot is soft because there's not a tremendous amount of energy holding it together. It can be pulled apart fairly readily. So when you make the clot in the clotting process, the first thing to do is to get the blood flow stopped, and that makes a clot as quickly as it can. That's the soft clot. To harden that clot, there's an enzyme called transglutaminase. And transglutaminase catalyzes these reactions here, glutamine, 